Good morning, everyone. Okay, that was really weak. Let's try that again. Uh, good morning, everyone. All right, much better. Thank you. Uh, I'm Stephen Moss from Databricks. I'm pleased to introduce our first speakers of the day, day two of the Data and AI Summit. So we have Patrick and Coy joining us from Bridgestone. And I'm personally excited about this topic. I think maturity and AI and the journey is it's going to be super interesting to see the path that they went on. And uh, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Patrick and Coy. Thank you. Maybe. All right. Good morning, everyone. I know we just did the whole good morning thing, so you don't have to say it again. Um, but thank you for attending our session on growing AI and maturity at Bridgestone. My name is Patrick Rudolph. I'm a principal data scientist at Bridgestone. I'm actually filling in for Anand Mehta, who couldn't make it today um, as the speaker. Um, you may have seen his name on the list as you were registering. Um, a little bit about me. I've been with Bridgestone for um, eight years. Um, in my role, I do model development. I also oversee and review model development for the data scientists on my team. We're an enterprise team, so we work on everything from manufacturing to retail. I'm um, really a, a wide spread of projects. Um, with me, I have my fellow data scientist, Coy McNew, if he wants to say hi real quick and introduce himself. Hey, my name is Coy McNew. I'm the lead data scientist at Bridgestone. I've been there about maybe three years. Um, my background is mainly academics and consulting, uh, PhD in engineering. But uh, yeah, you'll hear more from me in a minute. Yes, we'll, we'll do a trade-off here in, in just a little bit. Um, so the background with this session is we really wanted to just kind of tell our story at Bridgestone and growing our AI um, maturity. Um, and really what we want you to take away from this is I'm sure many of you are also going through your own journey and hopefully by hearing you know, some of our successes, some of our pain points, some of our learnings, you can find some things that you can take back and apply in your own journey. But also, I want to use this as an opportunity to you know, start the conversation. I think that's a main objective for these types of conferences is coming together, is everyone's journey is different, everyone has different pain points, everyone has different learnings. I really want to hear you know, comments, feedback, either in the session or outside of what other people are, are going through in their own journey. Um, so the topics we'll cover, um, I'll do a quick intro on um, Bridgestone as a company. Um, we'll talk about our data science team and where it fits within the organizational ecosystem. Um, part of this journey, we were migrating from on-prem to cloud, so I'll talk a little bit about our data science technical stack and how that's been evolving. We'll talk about our model, model lifecycle process, so how we develop models on our team and get those implemented into production. Coy's going to talk about a few ML use cases and really bring it to life on these processes and how we're using it to, to implement in Bridgestone. Um, talk a little bit about strategy, how we're thinking about projects and our portfolio and our intake for what we work on when we think about our AI work. And lastly, give kind of a consolidated view of some of the key advice and lessons learned that we've, we've had over this journey. And hopefully at the end, have, have some time for some q and I've got the clock here keeping me, keeping me on time. So first, the required inspirational quote. I like to think this is more of a useful quote than, than just inspirational. Some of you may recognize this as, as Gaul's Law uh, on systems theory. It basically say, states that a complex system that works has almost certainly been built or evolved from a simple system that worked. If you try to build a complex system from scratch, it almost never works. You can't go back and patch it up. You have to start over with a simple system that works and then evolve it into the complex system that you, that you want. And I really like this not just as a quote, but as a, a principle for many things. I definitely think it applies in AI maturity, especially if you're like many companies where you're in the beginning or you're trying to scale it and go into other areas of the business where it's in the beginning. You have to start simple. You know, either find simple problems or take complex problems and simplify them even if it feels like you know, you're um, cutting corners maybe a little bit or you know, manually doing things that you're gonna, should be automated, you have to trust that once you get that simple process working, you can evolve it into what you need it to be later. A little about Bridgestone, um, our company. We are truly a, a global company. We have about 180 manufacturing plants and research facilities across the globe. We handle everything as part of the cycle, all the way from sourcing the raw materials, through the R&D, through the manufacturing and sales, not just to retailers and um, auto manufacturers, but we also have thousands of company-owned retail stores where we're selling tires and giving services, not just for those tires, but also our customers' vehicles as well. 
We're obviously best known for tires, but we have a wider range of other products as well. Um, anything from golf balls all the way up to um, one of my favorites is seismic isolation supports, which are these massive rubber columns that go under buildings to protect them from earthquakes, um, which are pretty cool. We also had development for other projects like tires for the, the lunar rover and, and other cool things. So if you're interested in our company, definitely encourage you to go out to our website. You can see more information and press releases and things like that. So starting out, just setting the stage with our organizational ecosystem. Um, you know, I think like many big companies, we're constantly reorging. Teams are forming, teams are merging, teams are splitting. So hence the kind of lava lamp uh, representation here of our teams. But in the middle, you see we have you know, our core data science and MLOps team. That's, that's our team. Um, and a few years ago, we were combined with a few other teams like data engineering, data management, business intelligence to form an enterprise data and analytics team. After that, um, we were moved into IT. So now we were not quite as adjacent, but now closer to other, other teams like cloud engineering as well. And as you can imagine, we rely a lot on these teams to get work done. Um, and some are closer than others. And I think this really speaks to the, the first point I want to make about just building those relationships. Because if you rely on these teams, they're obviously going to have competing priorities, and you have to really find those partners that you can work with. Now, obviously, there's formal processes that you have to go for certain things and certain requests, but if you have to submit an IT ticket every time you need something that's going to go into some black hole queue for two weeks while someone tries to figure out where to route it to, you're never going to get anything done. So you need to definitely have those partners within these different teams that you can, you can lean on and leverage. Um, somehow the formatting got a little weird. Hopefully this works out okay. Um, talking a little bit about our, our technical stack. So like I mentioned, we went completely from on-prem to cloud. When we started, we had basically two servers for Python, one development, one prod. The prod was really just for scheduling Python scripts to run. We had one server for SaaS, just because we could only afford one license because it's so dang expensive. No offense to any SaaS users out there. Um, we were using GitHub for basic branching um, and code versioning, but really weren't doing any CI CD processes. You know, in fact, you know, migrating to prod in this environment was essentially me going into the file system, creating a folder called prod, pulling down a master branch, and then going and scheduling a cron job to, to have it run. So definitely not ideal, but we've come a long way since then. So since then, we've moved everything into cloud environments, mostly on AWS. We brought in Databricks. We have proper environments for Sandbox, Dev, QA, and production. We're managing models and workflows within that using CI, CD, um, using repos and pipelines within ADO to do those deployments. But also, we're utilizing other AWS services as well. And this is another key point that I want to make is, you know, while we do 90% of our development um, in Databricks for, you know, model development, deployment, all the things that we, great things that we use Databricks for. You need that flexibility sometimes to you know, spin up a custom EC2 instance to you know, have a specific GPU combination driver or something to, to run a model or do some application development. And those are skills that we make sure that our team has and we have the ability to do it and it's definitely come in handy. Especially if you're an enterprise team, you have lots of different projects, there's gonna be cases where you need to utilize things outside of a single, single platform. We've also been doing things like deploying some basic front-end apps using Streamlit. So we would take those scripts, put them into a Docker container, and deploy those on EKS within AWS. So we're definitely utilizing a lot of those services, and it has been really great to have those skills, and it's helped us get things out a lot quicker. I could talk a lot more about the, the technology, and I'm happy to. I know everyone's technology is a little bit different, so I don't want to go too deep into ours specifically. Let's talk about our dedicated support structure for, for our data science team. So through most of this journey, we had about seven data scientists. So you can think about the number of projects that seven data scientists can do, the types of projects they can do, what kind of dedicated support should they really have to be able to get their, their job done. So ideally, it'd be something like this. You know, every project's going to have data requirements or ETL pipelines, so you're going to need several data engineers. Um, you need ML engineers to manage all the pipelines and the deployment across the environments. All this is within our new AWS environment, so you're going to need a cloud infrastructure engineer. There's lots of moving pieces, so you need a technical architect to coordinate everything and make sure you have security and governance in place. Within Databricks, you've got lots of workspace configurations and admin activities, managing users and permissions, so you need a platform admin. And then, of course, you need project support, project managers, product owners, 
Scrum Master to make sure that you have structure around the project and to keep things moving on time. Now, this is the perfect world, but in reality, what do you tend to get? This is pretty much what we had through most of our journey, which was one ML engineer. Uh, his name is John. He's somewhere in this conference somewhere. Um, but he's, he's done a great job at, at filling a lot of these roles and doing these things. But what, you know, what, do you, what do you do when you're in this situation? Well, for one, this goes back to building those relationships. So you have those partners that you're able to work with, someone that's not just going to say, what are my requirements, what do you want me to do, but actually work with you to, to build your solutions. Two, you can augment. So when we were early in our migration, we actually did hire some contractors to do things like setting up those ADO pipelines and things that we didn't quite have um, the broad skills to do, and that was very successful. Um, and third, you have to step out of your role a little bit. So, you know, the data scientists, sometimes you, you might have to set up an ETL pro process. You might have to do a little bit of application development. Of course, we want to protect the majority of the time for model development. That's why we, that's why we hire them. But there are going to be cases where they have to step out of that role in order to get things done. Now, we'll say, you know, since then, we have started to add a few more roles and are starting to go in the right direction. But I think for a lot of companies, this is probably a similar way that you start. You don't get everyone you need when you're, when you're starting out. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the, our model lifecycle and how we develop models. Now, this is something that is separate from the deployment and the MLOps piece, which is definitely a part of it, but it's really, this is the data scientist building the model that's going to get deployed into production. And this is something that is very important to have, because I think the last thing that you want is for your data scientist just to kind of be floating out there, doing some work, building some models, and then at some point it seems like it's good enough and you call it done. Um, that's not good for anybody. You really need something like this with a process to put structure around it. And here we have three different stages. Each stage has a well-defined review process and approval process to move on to the next stage. Um, it starts with the pre-alpha stage, which essentially is three questions. What are we doing? Why are we doing it? And can we do it? And that third piece is that assessment, is that uh, feasibility assessment, which is very important. And honestly, a lot of projects do and should stop at that point. Maybe you don't have enough data to produce a good model. You have low predictability. Maybe the business is not operationally ready to consume that model. That's the type of thing that we're going to uncover in the pre-alpha phase. Once that gets approved, it goes into the main model development. This is the heavy work from the data scientist, working closely with the, the principal to cover things like not just the modeling technique, but how you're handling outliers, uh, imputing missing values, all your feature engineering. All of that work until you have a model that you think is a good enough release candidate, an alpha 1.0, if you will, to move on into the beta phase. And at that point, we have a formal review to check all of our boxes. That model gets promoted up to beta. And then it goes um, really on to um, getting in front of the business for user validation and some sort of beta deployment. Once the users, business users validate that the model is serving their needs, it goes on to the full production deployment and model monitoring. Now, obviously, there's a lot of details in there. Every project can be, can be kind of different when it comes to those phases. Um, it's intentionally drawn as, as a circle. This is not a linear line. You're constantly going back to you know, other stages within this process. There's one line that's drawn across there, but really, you could probably draw lines from, from any direction here. And if you go back a stage, you, know, you might be doing an alpha 2.0, and then you still have that same stage gate approval process with the appropriate stakeholders before you're moving it on to the next stage. All right. Now, that's enough um, concepts. Koi's going to take us through some actual use cases that we've been doing at Bridgestone to help bring it to light. Thanks. OK, yeah, so like Patrick said, uh, I'm going to take you through a couple of our actual use cases that we have uh, ongoing right now. Uh, we have two of them. One of them is going to be sort of machine learning based, and one's a bit more Gen AI related. Uh, keeping with the theme of the title here, it takes a village. Uh, I'm also going to highlight just you know, some other teams we're partnering with and you know, all the other support we have to get these things done. Uh, so the first one, uh, this actually started as an email from some of our research biologists asking us to help them um, evaluate or sort of help them figure out some genomic software they were considering buying. And ended up us actually developing a, a, an entire model from scratch for them and you know, taking over part of their process. So really worked out for the best. Um, as part of Bridgestone's sort of E8 uh, uh, commitment to ecology, we're constantly evaluating alternative sources of rubber. So the traditional source of rubber is the Havea tree. Uh, it grows in a very small part of the world, um, 
very particular climate that's already being threatened by climate change and you know, will only be more so in the future. So um, in order to, you know, to, to find a more sustainable source of rubber, basically we have to find plants that grow in other climates or are a little bit more hardy. So uh, one of the most promising ones is called Waiuli. Uh, it looks like this here in our picture. Um, it is a desert, desert shrub that grows in arid climates, um, including the southwestern United States. This picture is actually from one of our research farms in Arizona. So they've identified this plant to be a pretty good source of rubber. Right now, uh, uh, what they're working on is essentially a, a breeding program. So we have this plant, we're trying to breed it up to be a commercially viable product. That means selecting for traits they're interested in, selecting for, um, you know, most obviously maybe a high rubber content, but there's plenty of other, plenty of other um, macroscopic characteristics they're selecting for as well. Before we got involved, their breeding program looks uh, like what this left side of the slide is, so this is gray circle. Essentially, the research biologists plant the seeds for the next generation. Uh, those seeds grow into seedlings. The seedlings grow into mature shrubs. And then only at that point can they harvest them, measure the traits they're looking for, so like rubber content, biomass, et cetera, uh, and then select for the most promising ones that show the traits they're interested in, in, in um, selecting for, cross those together, generate the seeds for the next generation. So in that way, one generation of the, of the breeding program, one cycle, takes about two years. Uh, after we got involved, it looks a little bit more like this red circle on the left. So um, the biologists you know, plant seeds, they grow into the seedlings just as before, but in this case, they run a genomic panel on the seedlings, so they're left with you know, a bunch of genomic data that, gets in, that is input fed into our machine learning model that predicts um, future state of these plants, so it predicts the characteristics they're interested in selecting for. They then make that decision based on the information from the model, cross the seedlings together, the promising ones that they selected, generate the seeds for the next generation, uh, and complete the cycle that way. So in that way, you know, we've shortened this breeding cycle from two years down to six months, so this really accelerates the breeding cycle, helps us get to, to market faster, get to a commercially viable product more fast, uh, faster and more quickly. So what does the model pipeline actually look like? This is sort of a wireframe to explain that. Uh, I mentioned you know, the biologists run this genomic panel. We're left with this huge, wide data set of genomic information. In this case, we have about 10,000 potential markers. Uh, most of them are completely useless to us in our models. So um, our first layer here is pretty simple. It just uses some univariates and multivariate statistics to filter out uh, over half of them that don't show any predictive power towards our targets. Uh, from there, the next layer actually takes all those, uh, reprojects them down into model features, which we can, we can use in our model. Um, and that step is, you know, we use things like PCA, we use things uh, a little more nonlinear, like UMAP, to do that reprojection. Uh, the next layer, then, is our actual predictive model. So we take those model features, feed it in, and that's where we get our predictions of our traits. In this case, we're just showing rubber, but again, we have a model for several different traits. Uh, and we developed this whole pipeline then in, um, in Databricks using MLflow. So we basically take every decision point throughout every piece of these layers. So, you know, like the statistics that go into the filtering, um, any selection points around the dimensionality reduction, so hyperparameters there, algorithm selection, all these are parameters and experiments. We log every single thing in MLflow. Uh, that way we're left with a whole bunch of different model candidates we can choose from. Um, we can quantitatively select, you know, based on whatever validation curves or test scores, et cetera, uh, to get one we like. Um, once we've chosen a, um, a final model candidate, you know, Patrick showed earlier our ML model lifecycle, once we've chosen one we like, we actually take this whole pipeline, in this case, uh, served it as a Databricks workflow. So the whole inferencing is just a, a workflow served in Databricks. And I'll show you sort of how we, how we use that here. Uh, we, then, we then took that a bit further with this one and, and made a um, little application for the, the end users to um, interact with our model. Um, so how do they use it? So Patrick mentioned Streamlit. He mentioned our AWS environment. We basically have a thin Streamlit app that's served on an EKS cluster in AWS. Uh, the research biologists then go to this application. They, they go there with their you know, genomic data they just collected from their plants. It's this huge table. They upload the table directly into the application. Uh, within the application, we use the Databricks SDK to then you know, format that data, send it back to the backend in Databricks. 
It also triggers a workflow that runs our inferencing. Uh, from the model, it runs a couple other transformations that they're sort of interested in seeing in terms of um, plots and, and whatnot. Uh, on the application side, the, it basically waits until it gets a signal that that workflow is finished, goes and finds those results from delta tables within Databricks, serves up the results as tables, as visuals um, for the, um, the end users, the biologists to use then. So in this way, we kind of made this like self-serve, on-demand um, uh, application for the users to go interact with our models. Uh, it's working really well for us as well. And you know, Patrick mentioned this too. So you know, we like to make these thin, sort of simple front ends so that users can more easily interact with our models. Uh, we're not front end developers. We're not BI developers. So this you know this works for us. But anything that needs to be a little more professional kind of gets you know moved on to other teams within Bridgestone. So you know and. They use our whole suite of, of BI tools, but this is sort of where we leave it, and this works really well. Uh, the next use case is a little more Gen AI based. Um, so this one is in collaboration with our corporate strategy team at Bridgestone. Uh, the corporate strategy team, they, they work with a, just a ton of data. So they have all of these documents uh, that they amass, this huge collection. They call it competitive market information is how, is how they refer to it. It's essentially like um, you know, financial reports of companies. It is transcripts from earnings calls um, and things like that, market, state of market reports, those kinds of things about commercial motor vehicle market. Uh, they use all this information to uh, make decisions around various strategic initiatives. You, know, you can think mergers and, acquisi mergers and acquisitions, stuff like that. Um, there's just, there's just too much information there for you know, any one person on that team to, uh, whenever they need to make a decision, to manually go through and find the right document or, or remember what they read you know, a week ago. So uh, what we're developing looks more like you know, the right side of this, this slide here, uh, essentially you know, taking all that information, that huge, <clears throat> that huge backlog, chunking it, vectorizing it, making it into some vector stores so that they can go and in natural language, through natural language prompts, like actually chat with you know, all of that data behind the scenes instead of, again, looking it up in a manual fashion. Um, and then, of course, you know, they're, they're getting new reports, they're getting new information every single day. So uh, we also have to have a, a, a way to keep this information up to date, because if it's not up to date, they're not going to use it. So our current version of this application looks like this. Um, you know, the middle frame is pretty similar. We, you know, we have this sort of thin streamlit application that's served, again, in, on EKS and AWS. Um, where uh, we actually set up a little chat interface. I don't know if you're familiar with recent Streamlit uh, development, but they have a nice little chat function now. Uh, and then we have a, a RAG framework behind the whole scenes. So again, this is retrieval augmented generation, right? Uh, the user comes in, signs in this application. Uh, then they can actually chat with you know, that whole backlog that we set up behind, or sorry, that whole, um, um, all the whole domain knowledge we set up behind the application. Uh, to do all that, we basically set up some workflows in Databricks that chew through the entire library uh, and do all that careful stuff we talked about, chunking, vectorizing, embedding, inserting into relative vector stores. One thing we added to this application is um, the ability for the, like I said, the user is going to get um, you know, more information every day. We set up the ability for the user to actually go in, take a new document, upload it directly to the application. Again, that uses Databricks SDK to send the data back over to the back end in Databricks trigger the relevant workflows that do the chunking, vectorizing, and update and insert uh, the new information to those vector stores. Uh, and then you know, that updates the knowledge base behind the application, lets the user interact with more relevant and more recent data. So in that way, we kind of, again, created this sort of loop that's like an on-demand, self-serve application for the users. Uh, <clears throat> another piece that's pretty complex, I just kind of crammed it in two bullet points on the right there, is. Um, we're actually using Databricks back in again to, to log every single user interaction. So every time someone comes in and interacts with our, our you know, RAG model, we log what they asked, we log what we said. Um, we're going to incorporate some sort of human feedback about how good those answers are as well. We use this for a number of things, uh, and we're planning to use it for some more things. So essentially, we're using it to evaluate how good our RAG framework is. Uh, we're going to use this data to do any sort of fine-tuning efforts in the future. We're not quite there yet, but you know, we'll be there at some point. Uh, and then in combination with um, the corporate strategy team, we actually developed a human annotated data set. So basically just a, a long data set that says, 
hey, here's some example questions we would go in and ask your app. Here are the right answers to those questions. You know, spanning the range from pretty easy to pretty difficult. Uh, of course, we couldn't do this without them because we don't, we can't understand how they want to use the application. Uh, but that's really powerful to have that sort of answer key because that lets us use uh, tools like um, like the LLM evaluation suite and MLflow in combination with Databricks, obviously, to put a number on how well our, our RAG framework is performing. So, you know, um, if we make a tweak, say, if we change system prompt, if we change some something about retrieval, uh, we can actually run our you know our our uh, answer key back through it get a value, a quantitative value, hey, how well did that perform? Was it slightly better, was it slightly worse, was it no different? Um, I think that's you know, probably the biggest challenge we face with generative AI product, products is sort of how do we quantitatively decide what's better than another thing? Uh, but this, this lets us do that, right? Um, and uh, is it, that's a really powerful tool. It helps us think about it again, like the ML model lifecycle that uh, Patrick showed earlier so we can actually iterate and improve. Okay. I passed my time, so I'll hand it back over to Patrick. Did anyone else notice that the transcript thought that uh, a corporate strategy team was using that for murders and acquisitions? <laughs> so, anyone who is reading the transcript, we are not using Gen AI for, for murders. Okay. So, we talked a little bit about our technology, our process, you know, a few use cases of what we're doing in, in Bridgestone. I want to end talking a little bit about some of the strategies that we're implying when we um, are talking about our AI maturity. It starts with our portfolio strategy. So what, what you choose to work on is, is very important. So how do we choose our products? Um, there's products, projects. Um, there's a few um, strategies that we have here that I'm going to cover. Um, the first one, uh, these were supposed to trickle in, but I guess the formatting did messed up. The, is a hybrid approach of top-down and bottom-up initiatives. So you know you have to listen to your leadership. You have to see what's important to them. You have to work on those things. That's kind of a given. But you also have to look for innovation ideas. You have to look for things that they may not be seeing. You also have to be thinking about your capability building, like what sort of capabilities and technology are you bringing to the table so that when you do have a high-value project and something new like Gen AI, you're ready for it and you're not so far behind that you, you can't catch it back up. The second one is, is balancing risk. So especially as an enterprise team, you get into different areas like legal or HR. Um, you really need a lot more governance um, around things like data privacy or IP. And so having something like a, an AI committee is a good idea to help manage that risk. Um, the third one is dual speed, um, buy and build. So you're, especially in a large organization, your demand and your resources are never going to line up. So when your demand exceeds your resources, which tends to be the case, you know, what do you do? You can go out and you can see if there are solutions out there that, that you can buy. There may also be solutions out there that serve your use case perfectly without um, having to build it yourself. Um, so that's kind of the combination of the, the buy and build. Copilot is a good example of one that we're evaluating for, for buy. That's an off-the-shelf solution that could be used for various things. So that's something that our team is, is working to evaluate. The fourth is get the flywheel turning with, with POC opportunities. You know, when we started this journey, moving things to the cloud, we knew it was going to be a year or two before we really had everything in place like it should be. You can't wait two years to start showing value. You have to start finding those projects where you can prove value, get some POCs out there, some quick wins to show that you, um, you can prove value with, with your work. Ah, the icons are trickling in, OK. The next piece is the value pools. So not just kind of our general strategy to it, but what is the value that we're, we're getting from our projects? Now, every project that we intake goes through and it gets classified in one or more of these value pools. Now, this goes back to our life cycle in the pre-alpha stage. You know, hopefully everyone is asking when you take on a project, what value am I getting? You know, the, the immediate first thought is how many dollars? A lot of leadership is talking about dollars. That is one of them. It is one of the seven. Um, you can see the direct P&L there for, for sales dollars, but it's only one of them. And it's key to have other, other metrics that you can deliberately take on as something that you're going to provide value. So it could be something like customer experience. It could be reducing risk for something like fraud. There's lots of other things that you can provide value for other than just dollars. Now, you have to have metrics to support these, both for your, for your case and also for your, for your measurement. Um, but once you have those, 
you know, it's, it's pretty easy to set up your monitoring such that you can make sure that you're hitting your, your success criteria. And you also kind of are making the assumption that things like customer experience and uh, risk avoidance are going to lead to your bottom line, either in sales or cost. The next point is uh, scaling AI. You know, I think that especially in our team and many teams, they focus so much on these first two points, which is algorithms and technology. So what models are you building? What technology are you deploying it on? How are you getting it out there? And those things are important, and you have to have those to get them out there. But 70% or the majority of success when it comes to your AI maturity is really around people, process, and culture. If you don't have your leadership buy-in, if you don't have your business readiness available to take in these models, you can build the best solution in the world, and it's just going to sit there, and it's not going to add any value. So this is a big miss, I think, for even sometimes our team and our company and other companies that they don't devote the time and resources to address how are they going to scale with people, process, and culture, not just their technology, not just with their algorithms. All right, I wanted to end with just kind of a consolidated view of, of some of the key advice and lessons learned. A lot of this we've already talked about, but we'll have it in kind of one section here. Um, should have a few minutes for questions, so if there's any specific topic that you guys want to um, ask about or comment on, please feel free to do so then. These are in no particular order. The first one um, is initially in your journey, focus on proving um, and testing rather than standards and planning. Standards are great. It's almost impossible to put standards in place with actually going through the motions and doing the work. So get out there, do something, prove it, put in your standards. Don't try to plan everything in advance because you will never get anything done and you're going to have to throw it away and, and change it anyway. The second one is start small and simple. This goes back to Gaul's Law. You know, when you're just starting out, find simple problems or problems that you can simplify to get out there. When we were migrating to cloud, one of our first projects that we did was a basic sales forecasting. It was already implemented on our on-prem servers. The source data was somewhat reliable. We knew what the output should be. It was running once a month. It's a very good use case for us to get in there and lay a lot of the foundational things within Databricks and AWS that would scale to more complex problems, but in a way that was much simple and easy to debug and those types of things with that type of process. The third is being scrappy. So we talked about, you know, you're never going to get all the support you need. Sometimes you're going to have to step outside your role. If you just sit there and there's tasks that come up that, you know, you, you can't just say, oh, that's not my job. I'm not going to do it. Look for opportunities to kind of upskill yourself in maybe some of those fringe areas. Definitely protect a large portion of your time for what your job is supposed to be, but don't be afraid to step out of that job to do things, to, to get things done. The fourth one, probably this could be the, the number one, you know, going back to the title of our presentation, is building those relationships. You can't do it alone. There's going to be expertise in things like data engineering. Find your business SMEs. You need those leadership um, sponsors as well. Is build those relationships. You've got to find your partners out there that you can talk to, that you can tap on, that you can help you in your journey. Number five is utilizing your tech partners. You know, whether it's Databricks, AWS, or Microsoft, if you have these technologies within your company, there are resources dedicated um, to you for help. And they, are, they want you to succeed. They want you to succeed with their products. So when you get stuck, when you have problems, reach out to them. Um, many times they can give you help and point you in the right direction. Um, you know, I'll definitely say, kind of like with number four as well, you know, don't just look for someone to dump a problem onto. You have to try things, you have to work through it. But if you're stuck, you know, Going to them and asking for help, a lot of times you can get the right direction. I will say that our Databricks CSE has been instrumental in getting us deploying things in production and helping us work through a lot of the blockers that we've encountered. Next one is not relying on a single platform or service. So if you're doing lots of projects across many areas, having that skill set and the technology ability to do things like spin up an EC2 instance or you know, deploy a, an app on EKS, use those, those services as you need whether it's you or someone else that's doing it, having that flexibility allows you to move fast. Because if you're stuck in a platform that just doesn't do that little thing that you need, all of a sudden, what, what do you do? You're trying to go outside and get some third party to come in and do it. You need those um, the services available to you so that you can get done what you need. Balancing POC and high impact initiatives. So you know, leadership is definitely going to ask, what value are you bringing? What dollars are you bringing? And that's going to be a balancing act where you have to do those types of projects 
But you also have to build your, your capability. So kind of like I was saying before is when projects are coming through, you do want to do that value exercise, but you also want to weigh it with capability, especially in something like AI that's evolving so much. If you completely miss an entire area of it, you know, I was about to say after a year, but even after a few months, you can start to be so far behind that you can't even think about bringing in a project within that area. So make sure that you keep your capabilities up while you're also providing high impact to the business. And lastly is looking for opportunities to educate your leaders in your business units. So leaders and all sorts of people are getting bombarded with sales pitches, all sorts of information from you know, this company or that company about how AI is going to change everything, which is true, it is, but it's kind of confusing exactly how that's going to happen. So look for opportunities to educate them on specific areas of AI, whether it's you know, how models are built or generative AI, um, so that they have a better understanding and it will help them link their problems to solutions that, that we're able to deliver. So making sure to definitely cut through the hype. You know, one major point is always to tell them that LLMs cannot solve every single problem out there. Um, I think everyone has had that. I think even last year that was you know, the meme out there that you just slap an LLM in any problem and it solves it. So that's usually a good place to start with, with leaders or people who are new AI is given that point. So that is the end. Thank you for everyone for listening. We are hopefully right on time. It says zero, but.